So this is one of the pictures nearby us, near where we live. We live in Australia, in a place called Brisbane. It's the capital city of the state, one of the states there. And uh, there you can see there's a lot of volcanoes. Uh, it, uh, the, the past the volcanoes. We don't have anything active like you do here on the uh, west coast uh, with uh, Mount St. Helens and other volcanoes. And uh, So these are called the Glasshouse Mountains. They're named after a guy, a guy called Captain Cook named them. And uh, in Australia we've got kangaroos and uh, they're really cute. And uh, in, the play, in the city they actually become a little bit tame and they're used to people out in the, out in the country. They're pretty scary. And uh, we, have a, we have floods in Australia. I guess you have floods here. And here's a picture of guys in the middle of a flood. They're sort of carrying on doing some fishing, keen fishermen. And also we have uh, saltwater crocodiles. And uh, there's, uh, the, the tourists take the people around in a boat and they have these, put these fish out and up they come. And it look, looks a bit scary, doesn't it? But they're, they're monstrous crocodiles. But you know, there's a Bible verse Connected with science and apologetics, and you're probably familiar with it, Jesus said, he said, if I've told you of earthly things and you do not believe, then how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And the, so there's a connection between what the Bible says uh, when it speaks about things we know about, things we can check. If we, if we can't trust it there, then how can we uh, trust it in things where we, we can't check, like heavenly things? So that's why I t t touch on things like Geology today, I'm going to touch on the evidence for Noah's flood. And it's like this guy here, Jason, he said, uh, I've battled doubt in my faith life for a long time and most of it comes from evolution and dinosaurs and scientific stuff. And he says, and I have found your website most useful. So can I let you know what our website is? It's the creation.com. That's not particularly difficult to remember. You guys can remember that. There's a topics bar where you can... Uh, find t all sorts of things. There's a good search engine where if you've got questions on your science projects, you can go there. You can also get connected to an email, a new, uh, news system, if you want. It gets sent emails every, every uh, week or so about new latest things. But you know, talking about geology, evidence for Noah's flood in Australia, and one of the evidences comes through geology. And uh, it's interesting, the Apostle Peter talking about well, what was going to happen, the way scoffers carry on. He said this, uh, these scoffers deliberately forget that long ago, God's, uh, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Okay, long ago, the earth was formed out of water and by water. So do you know what he might be talking about there? No? If the earth was formed out of water and by water. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Remember, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. And remember, it says, and then God said, let the, dry, you know, let the oceans be gathered into one place, and the dry land appeared. So the earth was formed out of water, and by water at creation. And then it goes on to say, by these waters, that's the waters that were formed the oceans, the world at that time was deluged and destroyed. So what's he talking about here? Noah's flood. The world at that time was deluged and destroyed by these waters. And, uh, but what he says is that there come a time when people will deliberately forget this. They'll just sort of say, oh, well, you know, how can we trust the, the Bible? The things are not going to come true. You know, you can't believe what's in it. Because, but they forget these two things, creation and the flood. And, you know, in geology, that's one of the things that's happened. And uh, quite a number of years ago, some of the people that started studying the, the geology, one of the guys was named God. Charles Lyell, the picture of him when he's old, and uh, he wrote a book when he was young called Principles of Geology, and uh, in the title of this book, it's really interesting, it says, being an attempt to explain, an attempt to explain the former changes of the earth's surface. So what's he trying to explain? What happened in the past, why the earth is the shape it is, why the rocks are like they are. So we're trying to explain what happened in the past. See, with science, the problem is, with geology, you can't actually observe what happened. You know, with, with uh, physics, you can. You can put gases in things, and you can, with chemistry, you can put, mix things together, and you can watch them, and you can measure temperatures and that. With geology, you can't go back and look at it. That's the big issue. And so he's saying, he's saying uh, well, we're going to try to explain what happened in the past. How are we going to do that, since we can't see it? He says, by reference to causes now in operation. So we're going to look at what's happening now. We can see that because it's happening now. And we're going to say that's what happened in the past. 
So, and do you see how that works? And that's the way geology works. They look at what's happening now. Now, the big thing is, uh, do we see global floods happening now? We don't, do we? So that means if you can only use what's happening now, you can't use the, the Noah's flood, the global flood, as a way of explaining things. And so that's what geologists have done. They've, they've looked at all the rocks and they've come up with all these theories. And the whole point is, you don't, you cannot allow to mention Noah's flood. You've got to use stuff that you see happening now. Uh, and actually, Charles Lyell, you know, he knew what he was doing. He said that, uh, in writing to a friend, he said his aim was to free geology from Moses. In other words, we want to get the Bible out of this. And so that's what's happened. And you end up with a thing like the geologic column, which has got, you know, a, this looks really complicated, doesn't it? But you know what? It's just a, a table with uh, pictures of all different sorts of animals on it. And these are the animals where we find the fossils of them, right? And so, for example, you find trilobites, and they found a lot of trilobites in rocks which are found in the United Kingdom in a place called Wales. And the old-fashioned name for Wales was Cambria. That was an old name for it. And so they call it the Cambrian rocks. The geologists aren't very sort of sophisticated. It's just very ordinary. And they found dinosaur bones in rocks in the Jura Mountains. And they called it Jurassic. <laughs> And so they called rocks with dinosaurs in them. But look at the dates they've got. You know, the Cambrian, 500 million years ago. Here we've got the uh, Jurassic, 130 million years ago. Where they get those numbers from? The, you know, when you dig up a fossil, it doesn't have a, a label on it which says, I'm 130 million years old. You don't find a rock and it does, doesn't have labels on it. There's nobody there was marking off a calendar. The thing is, people just invent those numbers. And the way they invent it is based on Charles Lyell's, assuming that everything happened really slowly the way it happens today, except when Mount St. Helens blows up. And so that's, but you see, we definitely see the fossils. This is scientific evidence here, but the dates are an invention. So the, you see the fossils, you see them in the rocks, you see the order of the rocks, you can work out in the field and have a look at the order, but the dates are an invention. So what we do is say, okay, we're going to start with what the Bible says and we know that the Bible's true, we believe it's true, and because we believe it's true and, the, and you've got the Bible history, creation, the fall, the catastrophe of Noah, the, the confusion, the Tower of Babel, the coming of Christ, is dying on the cross and coming again. So this is, a, a, this is really a Christian worldview history, the way the history goes. And so the key thing is this catastrophe, understanding geology. Actually, it's a real key to understanding everything. You know, if you want to understand your heritage, you've got to go back to Noah's Ark. If I want to understand my heritage, you go back to Noah's Ark. You know what? My, my ancestors were on Noah's Ark. I got a, a, a direct link that goes all the way back to Noah. Actually, you guys have too. That means we're all related. So you see how that sort of works and you can trace peoples around the world by going back to this key event because uh, before, uh, all the people that lived before that event, only eight survived. It was Noah and his wife, their three sons and their, three, their wives. And uh, so we look at that. Let's have a quick look at Noah's flood. Uh, what, you see, the, I got, we've just got to look at what the Bible says about the, the flood and then we go and look at the rocks. So we've got to make sure, because there's only one place Noah's flood is described. Now Genesis 6, we read there, God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all the people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So, make yourself an ark. <laughs> and, that's, and it says Noah did what he was commanded to do. And so he built this ark. You know, I, I don't know how familiar you are with Noah's ark, but the... Um, Many, many people have got a picture of Noah's Ark as like a bar, big bathtub, you know, and it's full of these animals. They're all poking out the top. And you, th and you look at it and you think, it's just a little wave and knocked that over. It's so unstable looking. It's not big enough. But the Ark was actually monstrous. It's longer than a football field, 450 feet long. It was higher than a four-story building. And it had three decks, a bottom, a second, a third deck. It had a capacity of... 15,000 tons, which is a big boat, 15,000, and uh, incredibly stable, even in the roughest seas. Uh, and so the Bible describes how the, the, the animals went on, Noah and his family went on, and then they shut the door, and God shut the door, and then the fountains of the deep broke open, so water came from under the earth. And do you know scientists are discovering water deep under the earth today? 
seismic waves and looking at minerals and they're saying there's, there's a lot of water down there. There's enough to, under just North America, there's enough to fill the ocean three times over. So the water came from under the earth and it could have come from those source and, and then it uh, rained and the, the water lifted up the ark. And then eventually it kept rising and it says it rose greatly on the earth and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. So you see from this verse, could that have been a local flood? Just with all the high mountains under the entire heavens, were, could that have been a local flood? Couldn't have been a local flood, could it? Because if you're going to cover the highest mountains, you've, it's going to affect the whole of the earth. And that's what indeed happened. And, um, you know, and, and uh, everything that ha had the breath of life in it that was not on the ark perished. Birds, livestock, dinosaurs. <laughs> and that's why we find dinosaur fossils. And, and the Bible talks about how the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. On the 17th day, the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat in Genesis 8 verse 4. So Noah must have been keeping a log of, of what happened on each day and ticking off the days to be able to keep track of that. Where did all the water go to? Well, I, I put a little picture up. See if you guys can come up with any ideas. I've just got a picture of the earth and uh, where the water... Do you got any idea where the water might have gone to after the flood? What happened is the, the continents came up, the ocean basins went down and the water went into the oceans. So there we are. You're up here. It's, this, it's somewhere here, aren't you? That, that's where we are today. Is that be right? And that's where I came from over here in Brisbane, flew across the, and uh, all that ocean. So that's where the water's gone, it's in the ocean. And uh, actually, if you want to find out more, and what we've got is, a, there's a little book called The Answers Book. We've got brought along some, and there's sort of, we've made them really economical for, for you guys today. Uh, and so you can get them for $5 if you would like them. They're normally $14 or $15. So how did the water, how did, is it that the water's gone down? Well, what happens is, you know, you've got the, the whole of the earth. It's covered with some two miles of water. If the whole of the earth's surface is made even, you know, the ocean basins are pushed up and the continents are pushed down and the whole surface is even, there's enough water on the earth today to cover to what? Two miles. It's incredible. And so what, has, what would have happened? Tectonics. The oceans went down, the continents came up, the water flowed off. And, and that's what you find all over the world. It's evidence that the ocean basins have sunk. Now in Australia, uh, that's where I live again, it's a great place, come along and visit sometime. Over this side of Australia, this, uh, it's like um, across, as far as across America, and that's uh, Western Australia. We're very creative, we've got Western Australia. and, and uh, <laughs> Uh, and that's a place called Perth is there uh, and there's, if you just sort of take a little section across there on a geological map you can see where the, and there's the ranges there, but you can see where the continents have dropped down. So this is where Perth is, in the, this is the uh, city there and, and this is the coast and so this is water across there. Now you can't really see it because this is some 12 miles deep, ten, some 10 to 12, 10 miles deep this, down here. And this is, this is about 60, 100 kilometers across, something like that, 100 miles across. And so you can see that the, the, the edges of the continents have dropped down. Uh, and you can see all the sediments have been preserved here, but the sediments have been washed away here. And so the, when you look at the actual geological maps, now geologists who do the maps, they don't recognize Noah's flood, but you can see the evidence everywhere. As so the mountains rose, the continents rose, the oceans sank, and, and near the edge, and the same as in North America. Now, interesting, in Australia, like geologists, recognise that there was a great inland sea in Australia. And we're talking about Australia just today, but this is, where, this is a, a secular website, it's not a Christian website, a science website, and this is the big inland sea. The, it actually, the flood covered the whole of Australia, but this is all that remains of the evidence of when it covered Australia. And uh, you've got the same in North America. If you look up Google, you'll find maps. If you look up Eperic Seas, uh, E-P-E-R-I-C Seas, and they'll show you maps of how la uh, large parts of North America were covered in oceans uh, during the Cretaceous. And they find uh, shells in these rocks around here. So that's why they say that it was marine, mar it, was, it was oceans. And, 
So here you've got these, this, uh, the, all these sediments which are deposited and in this place here, that's where they find those shells. All over you find the shells. But in that place in particular you find all sorts of things. But you see, geologists don't recognise this as Noah's flood. You know why? The geologists are very good at describing the rocks and uh, look, knowing the minerals. But you see this geologic time scale with the hundreds of millions of years on it. So the, you know, these Aperic Seas, or this, uh, you know, where all these dinosaurs are buried, is a hundred million years ago. That's got nothing to do with Noah. Noah's not a hundred million years ago. People lived up here. So if, if the Bible's talking about Noah and a flood, they look up here and they say, oh, we don't see any evidence of a flood. Because, but they see evidence of, of, of oceans covering continents all over the world, I, I, here. And the problem is the dates. And so you really need to re re rethink the whole way, the way we understand these rocks from the way Charles Lyell put it forward. And there's a little DVD called Biblical Geology, and I'm sure, uh, I'm, um, sure you'll, you'll become familiar with that one day, but it's, it's really simple. And uh, what you do is you start with Bible history. Now, this is another way of presenting Bible history. Creation, 4,000 BC. The flood, 2,500 years BC. Christ here is actually one, or somewhere around there. This is, this is the, they believe he was born 4 or 5 BC. And the present, right? So the thing is, you look at the Bible history and you read what's in the Bible and you think, okay, how would that have affected geology? And when it talks about children of Israel going through the, you know, the desert, you think, well, that's not going to have much of an effect on geology. But creation is the main key. Creation would have a huge effect when the whole world was created six days and then the flood, the whole world was deluged and destroyed. So they're the two key events that would affect the geology. And so we take the time scale, tip it on its end, that's the way the rocks appear on the earth, right? And so this is the time scale. But then you say, okay, what rocks were produced? Now this is not complicated. So basically, creation event produces creation rocks. So lots of rocks in a short time. And then you've got the pre-flood era, long time, very few rocks. You know, like Mount St. Helens produced a lot of rocks, but not much compared to the, to the amount of geology that's around. The flood event, one year, huge amount of rocks produced during the flood, volcanic rocks and sedimentary rocks and all that sort of thing. And the post-flood era, long time, 4,000 years, and not many rocks. So that's just sort of rock. Does that make sense? That's sort of how to reinterpret ge geological history. And so you can make a, a little division. So we'll just pick the flood, for example. You've got the flood. These are the rocks that are produced. There's a period when the water was going up. And then there's a period when the water was going down, flowing off the land. So you've got the world being inundated. And you've got then the world, the water's receding off the earth. The Bible talks about that receded continually. And so when the waters were inundating the earth, you get lots of deposition of rocks. And you see that stuff around Grand Canyon. And when the waters are receding, you erodes the landscapes. And you see that around Grand Canyon too, the way, and all over the landscapes, the way it's eroded. And you can put in a little bit more. We're not going to worry, like uh, as the waters were covering the earth and as the waters were in channels. We'll talk about that. And so that's like a little geological model to understand and how to in reinterpret the, the, the uh, geologic column. And so we just look at it, for example, I, I look at some rocks in Australia. Okay, I've talked about this as the Great Inland Sea and there's lots of dinosaurs and this and these rocks and dinosaur footprints and that. So if you look at these rocks here, you say, okay, well, they're, they're, they're huge, they cover a huge area, so it had to be either creation or the flood. You wouldn't get all those rocks deposited in just in the slow processes between creation and, or, after the, or after the flood. So it might point to creation of the flood, but there's heaps of fossils in these, so it couldn't have been creation because there was nothing, you know, there's no death and suffering during creation, so it must be the flood. But they contain footprints. The animals were still alive because they were walking around making footprints. So it had to be as the flood waters were coming up, not while they were coming down. So does that make sense? That's not complicated. And uh, so it would have been around there on that little diagram. And so when you look at the geologic column, you know, this helps us to reinterpret it. 
And so you look at these rocks, the first thing you do is you get rid of the dates because the dates are what throws everybody off and the dates are based on Charles Lyell assuming things happen slowly and gradually, right? But the flood was a catastrophe. And when you look just the rocks, you find that basically this part is the waters were rising. This is the order in which the different animals were buried on the earth. Gen that's the general order in which they were buried. This part here, as the waters were falling, not very much compared to the other part. It's very surprising. I found it quite surprising. And this part is post-flood. Now, yeah, there's, there's a, uh, it's not exactly one for one. You've got to realize that each part of the earth has to be looked at sort of on, uh, separately. And so let's just have a quick look. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but this is a famous plant in Australia, near Sydney. You just go a little bit to the uh, west and you've got the Blue Mountains. And these are called the Three Sisters. So you've got sisters, three sisters, which are three mountains, I think, in the United States, haven't you? And uh, these are three, three, ro uh, three rock outcrops. And you can see they've been eroded away. They're made of sandstone. And you can see the sandstone in the distance. So the, the, it was deposited over a large area. That was deposited as the floodwaters were rising. And uh, when you look at the sandstone, you can see the layers of sand. And you can see these are the strata. Now, it's really curious that in, in just in between the strata, you can see these, these little lines on an angle. Can you see that? They're called... See, they go across the strata. So do you know what geologists call them? Cross beds. Is that hard? <laughs> Cross beds. And, and you see they're on an angle. And so that indicates something about the way the sand was deposited. So, so for example, uh, and there's an, uh, what, the way it works is you've got water coming, flowing down, and it's carrying lots of sand in it. So it's, it's, it's full of sand and it's transporting it down. And when it drops the sand out, it drops it on the, on the front edge of these little sand waves. Here, this is exaggerated. It drops it on these uh, front edges. And the sand, as it builds up, it builds up sideways. And as it builds up sideways, it, it actually leaves this little trace of these cross beds. So from the cross beds, you can get an idea which way the water was flowing. And you, and you can also get an idea for, you know, with the size of the beds, how fast, how deep the water was, how fast it was flowing. You can get these ideas. And so, and so the, the, when you look, this is Sydney. The, uh, the, uh, the uh, bl three sisters are over here to the edge, and this is a very large, uh, a, la a large-ish basin of rocks. And, and you know, geologists have said they looked at those layers of sand, and they said, "How were these deposited?" And they always come up with an answer. And you know, in 1844, they were deposited under the ocean. That's what they said. But it doesn't really, that's what every, they thought everything was deposited under the ocean. But then in 1880, they, they thought, oh, they must have been deposited under glaciers. You know, isn't it amazing? And then in 1883, it looks like because there's such big, way, big sand dunes, it must have been in a desert. Because it wouldn't, and then in 1883, partly a desert, partly a lake. In 1920, in a great big freshwater lake. And then in 19... 2064 deposited in a river because you have to have moving water because of these cross beds. And then in 1969 in a tidal marine delta. So how do you get the movement? And then in 1975 in a wide shallow river. <laughs> you say, you see, the, 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 the point is that geologists will make a claim about how something was deposited. They will say something about the environment that it was. Most people, you don't, when you hear them say it, you think, oh, they must know. But they weren't there. They didn't see it happen. That's the key. They didn't see it happen. And so they're trying to explain it using modern processes that we see today. But that didn't fit because the sand waves are so big. The sand covers such a huge area. You know, what, what sort of area on the earth today does that? And uh, so that's why they struggle. Uh, but, you know, uh, one of the geologists that I... I've been in touch with, or yeah, I've been in touch with him, Patrick Conaghan, as he looks at these sand layers around Sydney, he finds that they, co they cover an area, they go across 250 uh, kilometres. That is about uh, 100, 150 miles, something like that. Cover 150 miles across. And so he says there's a water water up to 60 feet high, 80 feet high, 250 kilometres, 100 mile, 150 miles wide, coming down from the north at enormous speed, delivering sun, tons of sand into the 
bits in the area. So he, he had the idea that there must have been a catastrophe. This couldn't have just been slow and gradual. There must have been some sort of catastrophe that happened, something like Mount St. Helens. So I'll just point you to another. Okay, so that's around the Sydney area. And you, I was asked to talk about geology in Australia. The interesting thing is, when you learn about the, what happened in Australia, you'll find the same sort of features in the US. When I learn about what happened at the Grand Canyon, I find the similar sort of features in Australia. And that because the, 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 the same sort of things go right across the world. Anybody know the name of this place? You know what it is. Any student know the name of this? It used to be called Ayers Rock. Have you heard of Ayers Rock? It's a big rock in the middle of Australia. It actually goes underground. And it's a sandstone rock that's sitting up like that. People come from all over the world to look at it. It's not as popular as Grand Canyon, but it's pretty popular. And they're not far away, they've got some other rocks sticking out of the ground in the middle of the desert. There's not many people live around here. And uh, when you go in between these rocks, this is called the Olgas, and the, and the indigenous name is Catachuca, meaning many heads sticking out of the... the but you find that um, it's made of boulders. Boulders, rounded rocks, great... Do you know what I mean by boulders? Am I saying that right? <laughs> you can understand that. So... Um, They've been rounded by flowing water. They've been carried along in water. And look at the size of them. How fast would the water have to flow? And here we're looking at the edge. These, these things go up 1,000 feet, these, these things. And here you can see the boulders have been carried along. And you think, would that be a little bit of water that carried that? Or would it need a lot of water? It'd need a lot of water, wouldn't it? So again, here's evidence right in the middle of Australia, which is now a desert, of... Um, enormous flows of water which carried these rocks and brought them along. And you find the same thing over here. These big, they call them boulders, conglomerates, quartzite boulders, uh, the same sort of thing, the energy of the water. Now we're back to the three sisters. So the flood waters deposited these sand as the waters were rising. Now when the waters came up, what's happened? They reached the surface and they covered the whole land. And then as they were flowing off, they eroded the landscape flat. Right? So that's part of the characteristic of Noah's flood is you get these flat plateaus. Now you might not see many here on the coast, but as you go to inland, you can see a lot of these flat places. And so these flat plateaus. Now this, I showed you this volcanic area. So the volcanoes have, have, have erupted. But the, in the background, you can see there's a, a plateau, right? And so this flat plateau behind the volcanoes indicates that the land surface was eroded flat. And a lot of material around these volcanoes was eroded away. So, and that indicates that, um, you know, that that would have been as the waters of the flood were receding. Now you've got a place which, which is, they're not volcanic rocks, but you've got a lot of uh, remnants of um, sedimentary rocks sticking out in a desert. Do you know what that's called? It's called... Monument Valley. Has anybody been to Monument Valley? See those rocks? You can see the flat surfaces and you can see also how the water has eroded around those places in Monument Valley. So there you go. The one characteristic of the waters receding is the flat, flat plateaus. And here's one in the middle of Australia. It's not far away from Ayers Rock and a lot of people mistake this for Ayers Rock. It's called Mount Connor. Look how flat it is there. And, uh, and then the surrounding landscape is also flat. That's been uh, eroded flat by the waters of Noah's flood receding off the earth, Mount Connor. And uh, the other thing to notice, here we're back at the Three Sisters again, you notice the great big wide valley. You've got a big valley and the river that's in it is only small compared to the valley. And uh, that means that the valley was eroded by a lot more water in the past than is actually flowing through it now. And do you know what geologists call this? They call that an overfit valley, where the valley is too big for the river. It doesn't fit, it's overfit. And, 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 that's big, and actually most valleys in the world are overfit valleys. They've been carved by a lot of water, uh, much more water than the river that goes through them. You can see that at Mount St. Helens. You can see some very wide valleys and the, the river that goes down those valleys now is, is quite small compared to the size of the valley, indicating that those valleys were carved by, a, uh, you know, a lot more material carved them than is flowing through it now. 
And here's another thing that is characteristic. So you've got plateaus and valleys, and another thing is you, like this is the, uh, the, the algas, you know, those big bouldery things. But you find down here there's very little debris. I say debris. Nobody knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's debris. Is that the way, do you understand what I'm saying? Did I say that right? And so if this has been eroding away for millions of years, you'd expect to find all this stuff, heaps and heaps of stuff here. So it's just, but it's not, not there. So it's been, whatever eroded it has carried the material out. And since that happened, there's been very little has been deposited since. And you, like Mount Collin, is to find the same thing. Very little debris there. And you find the same in the Grand Canyon. You've got the steep, the steep uh, walls on the, uh, on the cliffs. And, uh, and where it gets shallower, you don't find much debris down there, indicating that it was carved not that long ago. Now, there's another amazing thing, a feature of the flood, the Noah's flood, uh, is that you have these rivers. See, this is a, a mountain ridge. This is a, like a, a, a um, I don't know, it'd be about, I suppose about 1,000 feet high, maybe 800 feet high, 300 meters or something like that. And you can look, there's a river flowing through the ridge. How come the river flows through the ridge? Didn't have any sense. Should the water, when it rains, the water should run around the ridge and doesn't go through it. How did that happen? And you find these things all over the world. There's, uh, here's one in uh, North America, Appalachian Mountains, the north of Harrisburg here, same thing. You've got, it's called a water gap, where the, the river flows through the mountain. And there's actually multiple gaps in the Appalachians, same where I had that other picture, where the river flows through ridge after ridge after ridge after ridge. That is so strange. Uh, but it's not strange. If no, it's, if Noah's flood explains it easily. So here you've got the ridge, right? You've got the, the, the ridge that runs along. And the water covers the whole thing during Noah's flood. The water's covered the whole of the earth. And so the water's then starting to flow into the oceans, right? And it's going across the ridge, right? And the, the ridge is an uneven, you know, an uneven height as it goes along. And then as the water level goes down, guess what? Some parts of the ridge poke above the water and there's some parts still below it. And so the water will flow through the parts that are low and then it'll erode those parts. It's focused on it. And then as you continue, the water continues to drop, that part where it's eroding will get, get eroded down lower and lower, and you get this narrow part that the water's flowing through, and when it's all gone, you end up with these ridges which flow through mountain ranges. They're called water gaps. And you find them all over the world. Find them in India, find them, well, there's the heaps in the Appalachians, you find them everywhere in Australia. Uh, evidence of Noah's flood. So we've still got about seven minutes, is that right? I think we have. And uh, let's, okay, I just want to touch on a, one other thing. In Australia, there's heaps of things you could look at. But you know, in Australia, there's a lot of coal, coal, you know, that you burn in a power station, black stuff. And, um, uh, this, uh, and this is an example of a, an open cut, open cast coal mine. And this is a power station and they just take it in by conveyor belt into the power station. And they've got these great big excavators here, which digging out the stuff, the digging out the black mineral. And uh, it's amazing. And the idea is, geologists say that coal forms in swamps. You heard of that? And they say that because, because they have to find a process which you see happening now, Charles Lyell. But you know, when you look at it, you find it doesn't fit that at all. This is some, one of the excavators as they're excavating. This is a great big pile of coal, something like 300 feet high, three, 350 feet high of this, this seam. Uh, and if, if it grew in a swamp, you'd expect to find really good soil at the bottom. But guess what? When you go and have a look underneath the coal layers, guess what? It's, it's beautiful clay. You could make some pottery out of it. So uh, plants don't grow very well in <laughs> in clay, and there it is there, a knife edge contact. And in the, in the coal, you find logs. You can actually identify the logs. Um, and, and the wood is quite well preserved. Here's another one. The, the log is preserved inside the coal. So there's lots of logs being washed in. It's rather than growing in a swamp, you know, it indicates that this material has been washed into place. And so if you've got, here's, here's the coal layer. 
it's uh, some th three, oh, I said 300 meters. I think it's 100 meters, 300 feet high, right? And uh, you've got an overburden here, not much over at the top. You've got this l excellent pottery clay underneath, not the best place for, grow for, for growing in a swamp. And uh, you've got all these la logs in it, and they identify the logs as a sort of pine trees which don't grow in swamps. They grow up on the, t on the sides of mountains. And uh, so that doesn't fit there. And you find also there's uh, layers of uh, pollen. Here's a half a meter. This is uh, 18 inches, two foot, of a thick layer of 50% uh, pollen. Now, you know, to get all that pollen there, there must have seemed some really bad seasons for hay fever. Lots of sneezing. It's more like it's been washed into place and water sorts things out, doesn't it? And uh, also you've got thin layers of volcanic ash, uh, which, and uh, whereas if the stuff was growing in place, it, uh, the ash would, it would sort of gr um, be dispersed. It wouldn't be in nice thin layers if, there was a lot, if it, uh, it took a long time to happen. It'd be like the ash from Mount St. Helens, if things grow on it and that, and, and gradually it gets dispersed and it's not so nice and even. So just to talk about radioactive dating briefly. You know, radioactive dating, nobody's got a machine that can measure the age of anything. This is a high precision argon-argon mass spectrometer. Can anybody tell me what an argon ma mass spectrometer measures? Argon. You knew all the time, didn't you? Argon, it measures different isotopes of argon, but it doesn't measure the age. And, uh, and, but basically, they, to get an age, to make assumptions, and from those assumptions, they calculate an age, but it's all based on assumptions. Uh, and so they don't know geologists actually believe the age that comes out. He always checks to see if it makes sense. And uh, I'll give you an example. This is a piece of sandstone. Uh, they found a piece of enclosed wood in it around Sydney, beautiful sandstone, came out of a quarry. And it's supposed to be 230 million years old. Now, so one of our guys actually sent it off to get analysed for carbon-14. And uh, as a consequence of that, they found carbon-14 in it. So the, and that carbon-14 should be all gone after just 100,000 years. So this is 200 million years. And so this is a strong evidence that indeed the, uh, that there was, uh, this is not millions of years old. So I'd just like to finish with just a couple of things, really. So we talked a little bit about evidence for Noah's flood in Australia, and, uh, and really the flood is what makes sense of this biblical worldview. It's sort of the, it's the key event, and that's why the Bible spends so much time on it, three chapters, so that we can find our position in it. So I don't know if there's opportunity for questions. That's where it is. And uh, this guy, Kenneth, says, I was raised in the church until my teens before rejecting it and declaring myself an atheist agnostic. The creation-evolution issue was the number one sticking point for me. Now, you guys would learn a lot about the biblical worldview, and you shouldn't have these problems. You should be able to see how it all fits together. And he said, how could I possibly believe the Bible if it was wrong from the very start? But of course you can, because the Bible is right from the very start, and uh, the geology is one of the keys.